Okay, I'm going to make a start. Um, I'm sure I won't, won't uh, no one will miss anything if you're joining halfway through. So, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, my name's, hello, are you all right? Um, my name's Stephanie Hosney, and I'm a business development manager at a company called um, Invica. It's part of the Invica group. Um, just to give you a little bit of context of the organisation that I'm currently working in, it's got about 120 staff, six offices across the UK, and my team's got about seven people in it. Um, so at the moment I'm responsible for building those relationships, um, finding the Drupal opportunities, and in particular my focus is on public sector um, contracts. Um, but previously I've worked in charities, social enterprises, and other small to medium Drupal agencies where I have been the sole sales and marketing person as well as client services and some delivery and, and, and. So this is the first time I've got a job that's actually just sales and marketing. Just one thing to do. Um, they've all been different in terms of size and structure, but they've all had the same theme to find projects that get the organisation's heart beating, whether that's financially or for the types of clients that we work with, um, that's in essence been my role. Hi, you all right? So just a quick show of hands. Um, who here is solely responsible for um, sales and marketing in their organisation? But out of that, who also maybe has another job? Like delivery and yeah, exactly. So um, I think this talk is really aimed at people that have also got other functions. So really it's about making the most of the time that you spend on sales and marketing because you haven't really got a lot of time for faffery and chasing, you know, you've got days to spend on writing tenders and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where I've targeted this at. Um, and this is the tip of the iceberg, you know, we've got 30 minutes just to talk about some tips and techniques and some things like that. Hiya, it's all right. Um, I'm not put off at all. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm not here to tell you what, that what you're doing is wrong, and I'm not here to say that what I'm doing is always the right way. It's just to give you some space to think about sales and marketing. And also, some tips and techniques that have worked for me over the time that I've worked here. Um, that's my Twitter handle. I tweet a lot of nonsense, so forgive me. But also, I'll be here all weekend if anyone's got anything they want to pick up um, outside of this. Um, just in terms of why I'm doing this, not just for the attention seeking, um, but in terms of contributing back. So I'm not a techie. Um, I can't contribute to sprints and the issue queues, so I just try to share a little bit of um, what I've learned from that, but also to strengthen the community. Um, I did a talk last year at um, Drupal Camp London, and that was all around specifically the opportunities with the public sector. And um, it's been nice to hear like some people that have um, came to my talk and then they got on the GCloud framework, for example, off the back of that, and then got work. Uh, you know, it's nice to sort of see that that's actually working for us. I think there's a long way to go. Um, but yeah, I think the more we can strengthen the community, the more we make ourselves look more um, professionally able to deliver those types of contracts, then obviously a win all round for Drupal as a CMS. So, get started. So, the first thing that I always look at in any organisation that I join is, do you want to be successful? And it's not a cheesy marketing line, it's what does success mean to you? So start with the vision, and then from that vision you can then build your own specific roadmap. Now, I've been in companies before where the vision is very clear, very defined, very set. You know, that might be in terms of financial targets. So we want to grow by another million pounds by this time next year, and the profit looks like this. And um, I've been in companies where the vision is we want to have a certain set of clients, or do a specific kind of work. Um, one of my colleagues says he only wants to do work that he loves with people that he likes. Now that's nice to say. Um, sorry, we were lost. That's all right. I blame the organizer. <coughs> oh, 
That's all right. You can leave. That's fine. <laughs> Great start. Um, da, da, da. Okay, so yeah, Chinese proverb: chase one rabbit. If you try to chase two, they'll both escape. So the focus on this presentation is about being focused and segmented. Now, it might be that you are one of 15 in an organization, but each one of those salespeople needs to have their own focus, their own segment, their own targets. The way I um, like to think about it is if you start with the pain that you solve, that will be the baseline for your elevator pitch. So, the door's really annoying. So if you say, I'm going to shut this door, sorry. So if you say, go to a networking event and then you meet people and you go, oh, what are you doing? I'm a wedding photographer. Oh, and you're like, yeah, yeah, but you can't really think how it's going to connect to what's good for you and, and move it on. I think, well, I say to people, we try and help our clients sell their stuff online. So we do that because through being a PHP agency or whatever it is that we do. Um, or customers want to be able to sleep at night because their server's not going to fall over because then the transactions are going to blah, blah, blah. So we make sure we've got a fully, highly available HA stack, blah, 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 you know, all the features and benefits. And oh yeah, we've got an agency in. You know, people are not really that asked about, sorry, about, um, what your job is and where you are and what your office is like. They just want to know what the service and the solution is going to help for them. And then that way as well, they can refer you to other people. Oh, well, Stephanie will be able to help you with that because you sell stuff online and da da da. Um, they won't remember what, you know, all the different commands and the lamp stack and all that stuff that we, we think everyone's bothered about. Um, so that's the elevator pitch. That's the be targeted, be clear from the start, let them engage with you. So if you can sort of um, articulate that in a couple of lines, that's always a good place to start in terms of what it is you actually do when people ask that question. Start with why. So why is what you're saying, selling, doing good for the customer? So again, building on that, what's the pain that you solve? Always ask yourself, why? well, why is that good? Well, I do this. Well, why is that good? Keep developing that. Um, but also, why is it better than everyone else's product? So I um, met someone yesterday and he said, yeah, yeah, we've well, got this great hosting stuff, and, blah, 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 and, and I was like, well, that's nice, but why is that good for me? What is it? You know, you just try and get past that shield of um, what's on your business card and what you do. Now, this is the essence of clever, quick sales and marketing strategy. So, all it is, is the clear thinking that goes behind... Um, it's the clear thinking that goes behind what it is that you say and how you say it and to whom. So if you can decide on who that market segment is, that one set of customers, whether it's sector specific or size specific or whatever it is, and we'll come on to that in a minute, then you find out what the message is that they need to hear and then deliver it through the most appropriate tools of where they are, what they're listening to. And it sounds really daft, but... You'll sit there in your office and you'll think, well, I want to sell everything to everyone and all the people and all the customers. Um, so I'll just scattergun all this stuff out and tweets and networks and events. And it starts with being very focused. So it's just, what, who are you saying it to? What are you saying and how? Um, so for example, you might sell beautiful um, CMS-driven sites to a couple of children's charities. Now, that's going to make you then shine to other children's charities because you then take your experience and what you've done and your passion and so on to them. But also you're sharing your learning principles with, it, with them, each of them, and they like that. But conversely, other charities like to know that you kind of you get them and you know how you work with them and you bring it over. It's always very difficult to keep saying, well, I've worked with this commercial client over here and then I've worked with this one over here and then that one over there. That's fine if you have. Nobody needs to know. You know, it's like that sort of don't tell everyone everything all the time. You just you turn up the messages, don't you? You turn up the volume all the time. Um, and, you know, maybe segment that through your, your website with to I am a whatever it is, looking to buy or whatever it is. Um, 
So you work out what they need to hear, you, you work out where um, they're going to be, and then you be there. You know, you go to their conferences, their events, you maybe write some editorial in their publications, um, you ring those types of clients. I mean, nobody likes cold calling, but you know, you, you say, well, can I come and show you what I'm doing? And, and it, that does work better in the charity and the public sector market. Commercial clients can be really hard faced when you ring them up and say, why should I come and see you? But if you have got that pain thing that you've solved for them, then the, the, the digital marketing manager is probably going to want to hear it because they've probably got that grief off their boss about solving it. Um, one to many, I've nicked this. Um, if you are a general agency specialising in lots of different things, then pick one market at a time. You might do like a six month campaign or a 12 month campaign and just pick out one, one thing at a time. Doesn't mean you have to not sell everything, but if you're trying to sell everything to everyone all the time, you're going to be exhausted and you know, you'll, you'll have a big fat burnout from that. Um, competitor review to gain advantage. Now I'm not necessarily a big fan of doing competitor reviews all the time because you spend loads of time looking in the rear view mirror at what everyone else is doing and you never get on with it yourself and then if you're anything like me you go they're much better at me at doing that so I'm going to stay away from that market no, you know, you, you, you do your review based on what it is that you do differently for that specific customer or what's better for that specific customer and then it's great to have rivals and competition because you drive up the quality but don't obviously do the race to the bottom um, with the price um, but then you start to articulate what you do better in relation to your rivals and you know similarly if you keep losing contracts to a specific um, agency either stop banging your head against the wall and going for them all the time or try and approach it differently see if there's something else that you can be saying or doing um, especially when you're saying about the, the pain points that you're solving um, in terms of retention and value um, Marketing isn't just about the new customers all the time. Yeah, it's exciting to find a new customer and have a meeting with them and go the pictures with them. But what I used to find is doing 20 of those a month was exhausting because you're starting new. And it's exhausting being nice all the time. You have to start from the beginning and start from scratch and build the trust and, and you know, just let, let them see how it is you work. Um, so what I often do, maybe every quarter, sounds harsh, but you print out your sales orders off your invoicey system, whatever it is, Sage or whatever, and you'll rank those customers in value to date. Now, the ones that give you the most money are not always necessarily the best ones either. They can be the ones that are the real pains who whip you all the time. But then, in that case, have another criteria. So you're ranking them in order of value, but also in order of how much you enjoy working with them, and they're nice to you, and they say nice things to other people about you. Because essentially, that then makes them be the... Um, brand ambassadors for you, they'll refer you to other clients and you know often it is referrals and word of mouth even though we, we don't really put that much kudos on it because it's not something we can control you know we can't place that advert in that magazine or whatever it is it's, it's about just relying on them then taking you out um, to their clients but you know ask them people don't mind as well if you say can you recommend me to some of your peers or can I come to an event that you're going to, you know, and, and just come along and tell people what I've done for you. Because if you can't necessarily get business from them now, you know, it will be better in the long term to, to have them um, as an ambassador. And, you know, do take them out for coffee and lunch. It's something that we never do because we're always like, oh no, I can't, you know, oh, I'm too busy, oh, they're too busy. And it's, just, it's just nice, isn't it, to be getting out there and building that relationship and being nice with people. Um, if you... Um, use that as sort of the compass of the clients that you like and the sectors that you like as well, then you know, you'll, you'll find those um, other good clients. This is the reality bites. Um, you've got to consider, is the um, product that you're selling right for that customer? I used to spend a lot of time responding to the OJU things and just days in my naive days I bid for something like the Motorsport Academy you know I was a small team of five these guys are this giant beast I think it went to some service integrator like Cap Gemini I spent a week writing the tender you know it was about ten years ago I was an idiot but at the time I thought well no we, we can service this customer everyone's a lot more sharp and turned on in this room I'm sure than I was at that time 
Um, but if the £1 million pound contracts are going to constantly go to that service integrator, number one, don't waste your time bidding for it. But number two, be partner if you want to, if you want to sell your soul, um, like I do. Um, with the service integrators, you know, they need to subcontract their work, they need a bench of people to go to. Um, but if you're then, you know, looking at what your vision is, like I said at the beginning, you're setting your vision, you're setting your targets, and you think, well, actually, no, I'm going to now earn another 100k project, then I'm going to be able to step up and then start bidding for more. It, you know, it gets you on that ladder sensibly. Um, so be, you know, sensibly allocating your time. Um, to uh, the right activities. Um, it's what's called high payoff activities. It's a really, again, another cheesy sales seminar I went on. But it's again about um, not being like a busy fool and you know chasing those rainbows. And you know, promotional activity is great. You know, pens and the materials and putting your name on the car and twittering. You know, I spend far too much time on Twitter. Um, it's nice, but it won't necessarily get those customers in, in that eye line because my customers are not following me on Twitter or in that right thing. Okay, it might be clever with all my hashtags and going to the right conferences and stuff like that. Um, but really, it's just a sort of... It's an activity that you do that makes you feel better because you think, oh, I've been sat in my office and I haven't got out for ages. I'm going to go to this networking event. And you end up going to these networking events and you're with these time vampires who just suck all your time out. And they're, and they're just like life coaches, or, which is great, don't you know. Um, or like financial accountants and solicitors and you're like oh, I've not actually done any business here but I feel like I have done some work you know got out there um, and when you've got your boss as well sort of saying get on the phone and make some calls and set up some meetings and you're like no where do I start that's when the panic sets in and you stop thinking clearly and you're like well, I've got to get to everything that I could possibly do and, and sell it but your focus has always got to be that customer and that community that I'm doing for time so, sales techniques. So, ask yourself as well, what kind of salesperson are you? I've realised I'm a very different salesperson to p other people that I've met and colleagues. Um, often that works as well in a pitch. Usually at the end of the pitch, I'll be like, "Listen, we want the business, but we're not. We're not um, cheesy salespeople. We're not selling double glazing. I've not got a Rolex and all that." And that. It's nice when people need to feel reassured that you're not trying to just fleece them for all their money. But then another time I'll walk into a room and they'll, once there were 16 procurement people and me. And I was like, I've got to really up my game here. You know, I'm really, the buzzwords and the, they loved all that cheesy speak. But I'm not selling my soul out, but I'm thinking, what kind of salesperson am I? And I've got to listen to what it is that they want to hear from me and need to hear from me. And a good question, actually, at the end of a pitch is always, what have you not heard today that I need to tell you in order for us to get this work? Because that really then puts it back on them and they go, well, actually, yeah, well, I'm a bit worried about the security of open source. not really talked about that very much. And I'm like, ah, okay, that's, that's the pain point for them. That's what they need to do. So what is it that you need to hear? I mean, I learned that from like a job interview technique, but I think it's, it's just a really nice thing to say. And also, you know, we want this work, if you, if you do. Um, what can we do to make sure that this happens? But it doesn't have to be in a sort of a, a double glazing way. So, also asking, listening, and, and asking for feedback is a massive one. I've not put listening here, but I should have. Um, the feedback from the pitch, from the proposal, from the documents, you know, yes, you're testing it out with people, not always though. Um, and you're getting like your husband or your friend to say, yeah, that sounds great, well done, it'll be great. But the feedback from the customer is in like, we were prepared enough, did we give you enough information, what else did we need to hear? Don't get like an injunction out on yourself like I always do, where I'm like, I need to know why we didn't get this. Not in a sour grapes way, just in a, I need to learn and improve. Um, but that really helps them to sort of, you know, we all do it, we put boilerplate stuff in a proposal, and the client goes, well, you just said that's what you can do but what could you do for us you know why didn't you even just use our name in the text or it's just daft things as well isn't it sometimes and we all learn big thing for me is about paying it forward again another cheesy line but all it means is about being nice to people and connecting people up I spend a lot of my time I don't know why um, 
oh, you're looking for a job, oh, you need that person, oh, oh, even if it's just stuff like someone needs a flat in Shoreditch or whatever, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know someone who, I'm just a mega gag, like, I always get involved in stuff, um, I started organising the event today downstairs, I was like, oh, you're looking for the toilet, shh, like, pipe down, um, but about contributing and linking people up, so, that can be about contributing your code, because then clients who are techie like to see that you contributed code, and what events you've been to, and you're on Drupal.org, and what's your number, you know, number one in Drupal.org world, or whatever. Um, but also just about your time, you know, giving your time back to people, and sometimes that's even just five minutes, you know, we're all busy, and we've all got loads on. Um, but that really pays off, because then people remember you, and again, I've got a lot of these sayings in my talks, um, People won't remember what you said, and people won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So if they enjoy spending time with you in a meeting or a pitch or whatever it is, they'll remember nice things about you. And I think that, that's kind of the legacy that I try to leave, is that if, if I can kind of make people feel a bit nice about themselves, it'll pay off financially. You know, you will get these big contracts. I got a call yesterday from someone who said, oh yeah, someone was tweeting about you, and then they retweeted you, and you talk about Drupal all the time. And we need a uh, Drupal review, and I was like, amazing, you know, great. Again, it's the Drupal community, and I'm tweeting, and everyone's really nice anyway. But it's just, it's just a sensible thing to do. Partner programs. Potentially a tank of piranhas, potentially a really positive thing to do. In the past, um, I've partnered with um, service integrators can be quite painful if you get in bed with the wrong people. Um, but also about sh other Drupal agencies. So um, we were having conversations yesterday and in the pub and stuff around, well, if you've got project managers and BAU people, like the cancer research guy yesterday was talking about these roles that a lot of us would never be used to having in a business. But if you've got those and then we've got the devs doing a joint bid together, means that you're you know, stronger, bigger, you can attract um, more varied projects and also have that step on the ladder to grow. Um, similarly, mergers and acquisition. Um, in a past company that I was in, we did a merger of, a, a, well, it was kind of an acquisition, but also a merger. Ah, it was a bit random. A um, couple of guys had a small agency, we had a bigger agency, we took them in, made them an offer, and they brought them in. It's not for the clients, it's for the, the bodies. But often it can be for the clients, you know, you, they've got a retainer contract that you want, you do a merger. Um, I know, for example, my company, the group that we're in, um, we acquire other um, agencies that are doing well and nicely, but, you know, they're, they're going to sort of stay here and they really want to be growing and they have that shared services model, so then they you know, do acquisitions and things. I, um, I, I think it really just depends on what you want to do. Someone said last night, you know, the reason why I set up my business was so that I could go and put the kids to bed. You know, that's their um, ambition. They're going to have a certain set of uh, criteria that needs to come with that. You know, they need to afford a certain lifestyle or be able to do certain things. So, it, it, again, it's, it's in yourself and you don't necessarily have to sell out. You know, there was a time when everyone was getting acquired by Acquia all the time. And I thought that that was what everyone was doing. Like, just everyone just wants to be acquired by Acquia. Um, but no, that's not always the case, but that's a great way to grow and develop, should that be your business value. Um, practice, so yeah, practicing your proposals, your pitches, doing things like this gets you to be um, practicing your presentation and realizing how distracted you are when people are coming in and out. What do you want? Do you want to come in? Uh, sorry, and um, the public sector is a great way to grow, as we heard before. G Cloud Five, G Cloud Five is launching. It's a bit, sorry, it's a bit late for that. Oh, all right. Sorry, sorry, no, don't worry. I've uh, <coughs> thrown off my stride. It's all right. So this is, this is the G Cloud Five, but there's also Contracts Finder, which is a really great um, tool to find contracts. But they can often be really big and beastly and gnarly and you don't want to get involved. I managed to blag my boss to give me two grand to get on this thing called Tracker, which is like a, pro a proposal scraper and it scrapes all public sector contracts. And actually it's really nice because you get about 60 or 70k contracts coming out quite regularly. You do get the beasts as well. 
But Tracker's a really good one um, because it scrapes them all. I used to spend a lot of time looking around for things and, you know, by the time you get there, it's already time for it to be deadline, day, and all that nonsense. Um, so that one's good. And again, it depends on what your strategy is and what your vision. But if you put yourself forward as like a thought leader in your field, so maybe you know a specific <coughs> sector specialism about something, or maybe you just like a certain client sector or whatever it is that you're interested in, you're passionate in. Because a lot of the time we're driven by what gets our heart beating when it's, obviously, you know, we pay the bills, but we, we want to do stuff that gets us excited. Um, and put yourself forward as a speaker, you know, they selected me twice, must be crackers, but you know, they, uh, people do say yes to you, you think, oh no, I can't do it. And you can't, and people are interested in what you've got to say. Um, and I've more recently done like really um, cringeworthy things like chair panels for people. Um, so if you've got like a local digital network, we've got one in Manchester called Manchester Digital, which is great, and they always want people from outside the region as well, so go on Manchester Digital's website. Um, they, people are always looking for speakers, you know, I've organised um, Drupal Camp Northwest for two years now with my colleagues, and every year we sit down and we go, right, keynotes, people, who, do, who are we going to have, and it's, you're only as good as your own imagination and your own network, so you put yourself forward in front of those people, they will select you, and it's, you know, as I was going to say at the beginning actually about the vision, and setting it forward. You know, I'm not the business owner, but I really force myself forward as the face of the business. Um, because often, and in previous companies, the people that are business owners I shouldn't really be allowed outside to talk to clients. <laughs> because they'll always have a fight or say something stupid, and I'm like kicking on the table going, shut up. Um, so whoever's the most appropriate person, it might not be you as the owner, you might have a shiny, excitable person. Um, who you can put forward for that, who's giddy about that. You know, my ex-bosses used to say, we're not speaking, don't put us forward for stuff. I was like, well, I'll do it. Um, I'm just getting involved all the time. Um, this summer in Liverpool is the International Festival of Business. And normally it's in London, but somehow L Liverpool's managed to get it up here. Up, sorry, I'm up there, where I am. Um, and it's over eight weeks, and there's all sorts of conferences, events, speaker stuff, things to get involved in. Um, I definitely encourage you to look at that International Festival of Business and just, you know, put yourself forward. The, the guys are ringing me up going, do you know anyone like, who can speak, who can, you know, get people put forward? And it's all about, um, there's a, a stream in it, which is the digital and creative stream. And they just really just want exciting new content instead of doing the same old stuff that they do all the time. Um, so I think Drupal's got a big part to play there. Well, open source in general, but um, it's that one. And then things like technology for marketing and advertising and stuff like that. Again, you know, do you want to spend all that money on exhibitions if that's your thing? What time is that? Is it for eight weeks? Oh, the Liverpool thing. It's like June and July. Yeah, like the whole of June and July. Um, but yeah, on if you just Google International Festival of Business. I keep calling it the International Liverpool Festival, but it's not. Um, I'll tweet later about the different things if that's helpful. Um, and again, you know, I used to spend a lot of money on exhibitions and stuff like that. And it can be useful, but again, it depends who your sector is. You know, you might only spend one set of budget on one specific conference because you know you're going to get a lot of work from there. And um, obviously, you know, you're not going to um, get in a huge, big digital conference and you're know, like a tiny little stand and you're competing against all these people, it can be really intimidating, so it might not be the right thing, um, but it's something to consider. I've nearly done honest. Uh, tools to keep you on track. CRM systems, it's just customer relationship management these systems. I'm sure you've all got them and used them, but for about five years I ran a design agency and my CRM system was a whiteboard and it showed where each proposal was at and did I need to do anything and when was it due and um, all the projects, and, uh, and I am not surprised I had a little nervous breakdown after five years because it was just all in my mind. And then someone introduced me to the wonderful world of Capsule. So I've used Capsule before, that's really good. I think it's like free for like two or three licenses. Um, and also um, we currently use Pipe Drive, that's a really good one as well. So again, you're just logging all your customers, you're logging your reminders, your engagements, your stuff like that. That's been a real good asset for me just to sort of 
have that follow-up reminders and um, where things are at and, and also you know then downloading that list and using it for your newsletter stuff is a, is a great way of doing it and then peer club again I'm lucky because in Manchester we have Manchester Digital and they have these peer club meetings and I'm sure you've got lots of different stuff where you are um, but really it's just about having a coffee once a month or once a quarter with someone and being able to be open and honest and say, well, this, I'm struggling with this, or how am I going to get in that? Because your boss or your line manager or your colleagues are not always the most appropriate people to have you know, um, those conversations with. And we have this thing called the stinky fish, and everyone brings to the meeting their stinky fish. So at the moment, I might be like, I've got a problem with this because I've got to do a talk to all these people. I don't know what to do. And it's just whatever it is that you, you can't get rid of and it's lingering around. Um, and sharing that is a really good thing to do and it might be that you just organise it yourself with a few people um, it's funny because I, I do it with four people who officially are my competitors but we've built a nice relationship over the years and we trust each other so it's, uh, it's a useful thing to do so in conclusion um, got to do the thinking before you do the doing so if I can encourage anyone to just spend some time with it tomorrow or Monday just half a day, sit down and just say, what's my strategy? Who are the customers that I really think I'm going to target first, or I want, or I love? You can still be doing all the other stuff as you, as you go. You know, you, you're focusing on one thing, and then other inquiries are coming through. I'm not saying ignore those ones, but what's your target where you're going to spend that high payoff activity doing? What products are you going to promote to them, and what are those messages, and how are you going to get it out there? Make sure that you involve the CEO or the boss, if that's you, if that's not you, in that. Because I spent a lot of time before now saying, this is our strategy, this is where we're going. And, th and it wasn't necessarily the shared vision of the other people. Um, and it's, everyone's got to be on board, otherwise they won't agree to stuff, they won't sign off on stuff, they won't put time and energy into it. So, you know, it's a, it's a thing you've got to do as a group. Um, and if the strategy is right, and the communication is right, and the message is right, it shouldn't be a hard sell. So, you know, don't be too hard on yourself that you've got to get out there and cold call and do this and that and the other. It, it should come naturally. We've all had to take projects we didn't want to pay the bills. But in order to really be successful and grow and develop and be happy as a, an individual and not burn yourself out, you've got to make that your priority that you're focusing on what you're doing. I mean, that's just my take on it all anyway and kind of where uh, I'm driven from but hopefully it's been useful. Sorry I was a bit distracted with all the comings and goings. Um, any questions from anyone? <laughs> Probably um, getting public sector contracts that was a real hard slog um, to actually get people to, number one, believe that the technology I was selling was good, and number two, that our agency could deliver it without failing. The first public sector contract I ever delivered nearly killed us all. We, ne we, we nearly went as an organisation because it was so awful. Um, but we realised that that was some internal learning rather than the project itself. So it helped to shape the organisation. Um, like how much time on one thing or like in my week like divided up if it's like a significant one I would spend maybe two or three days that's when it's a beast but I try and split my week up into three things so it'll be writing tenders and responding to inquiries um, mining my own network and being keeping up the relationships and then marketing speaking finding stuff to get, you know, contributing to. Yeah, um, you mentioned, you said you were a motorsport academy, it was, yeah. you, it was something that, it wasn't a, a, a sensible thing for you to, to apply for, and, and, and you were saying you were naive, but there's probably a lot of naivety in the audience as, as well about that. So if you've got, say, a team of five, what is a sensible project level to be able tackle realistically and um, how do you identify from the tiny little crumbs that you are given uh, how big a project may be? I think 
You only know what you can deliver yourselves realistically because you, your technical level. So if you've got five people on your team who are like crack coders and project managers, and they're a whiz, then great, you know, you, you know you're going to be able to deliver it, it's going to be high quality and so on. But I think you only know from just going for it, don't you, and learning from it. And as long as you don't go from delivering a small brochure site for a barber's to trying to get the most sport academy, then you know, you, you, you do a sort of sensible approach to that. Um, but in terms of like the crumbs that you're given, do you mean like when they do the brief and the proposal? Yeah. It's very nice when somebody says this is a fifty thousand pound project. Yeah. You know, it's very upfront and, and you know, well, okay, if that's the money you've got, we suggest that it's done, yeah. done this way. Well I always the first thing I think is, is does that include VAT? Then um, does that include support and hosting? If it does, how high availability? And as soon as you start to see that, you start to see how much is left maybe for dead. Then are they interested in discovery? So if it's an agile um, approach that you're taking, which most people do, then well, how much percentage can I allocate to discovery? And I s sort of have a price model rule of thumb, like X percent of any project is going to go in discovery, then testing, then BAU, then project management, then development. Well, so that's the scenario whether giving more, it down. <laughs> more but, than not. Yeah. Well, I, I always ask questions. Now, half the time they say, get lost, stop asking questions, we don't live here anymore. But the ma majority of the time, they will share a bit more. And I was really mean, actually, on my last one and said, I can't respond to this proposal because you don't know what you want. This is all crazy. And they went, we're going to have a Q&A with all suppliers. And they had, like, a teleconference. And stuff that came out was like, actually, we need it to be .NET. And, and I was like... Never said that in the proposal, oh, you crackers. Um, and then I told them, we're not responding because it's done it. And they were like, well, what if we said it was going to be true? Oh. So I, I know what you mean. Sometimes you ask those questions and they give you nothing. But I, I always just think, well, as long as you're polite and kind, you do get to the point at the end where you think, come on, you're an idiot. But not doing that any favors either. No, keep asking questions. And then at the end of the day, you don't necessarily want them. If they don't know what they want, or they're not asking the right questions, or they, they think they know everything, and there's like 16 people on the board, it's going to be a nightmare to deliver. And I say that from a position of, I've got massive sales targets, and if I don't sell, then essentially I can get fired. Um, but you, you know that if I, I don't want to be the person that brings that to the table, and everyone goes, the girl's an idiot because she bought this project. How do you organise your targets? I get given them. Yeah, so um, my boss says, you need to make this much money this year, please, and thank you very much. And I just have to go hell for leather. We do break it down where we say this many, this many projects, and that many, that value projects, and stuff like that. Um, but I'm a great believer in you can't control that stuff. That stuff is not within my control. What, what it does mean is now I won't go for anything under a certain value, or... I know that if they won't pay a certain day rate that I can't go for it because I won't get it. I mean, I often bring stuff to the table and my boss says, no, it doesn't fit for us, it's not the... And I'm like, what about my target? But I've got to go for the right stuff. And then, it's, again, it's about being ruthless and, you know, um, that's new to me. I don't know because at the moment we do a mixture of um, outsourcing to a call centre to ring some people for us. So I might identify people, they'll ring some people. So we spend some money on that. Um, we spend some money on sponsoring events and conferences and literature and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if I would be quick to get the checkbook out. I'd probably spend it maybe making sure you've got something useful literature-wise. So. I found that no one understood what we did as a group. They're like, oh, this is a group, I don't get it. So we got some cute stuff delivered that just sort of said, this is the businesses and that's what each one does. So if that's a pain point for your organisation, then something, I'm a print and design background, so I'll always advocate cute stuff. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd just say be careful with your spend anyway, because, you know, conferences can be 10 grand. You know, and what I, I just think, how can you justify 10 grand, you know, and robbing, whatever. So, yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. It depends. Maybe we can pick it up after. What about the, the time allocation? Well, forget the money. The budget wasn't there. What would you ask the full-time sales and marketing person to concentrate? 
building relationships, um, making the phone calls to say, can we meet, can we talk, or whatever, but building your own network, because cold calling is a tough ass job to do and doesn't often work and saps, sometimes sets you off on the bad foot. Um, look for tenders, put yourself forward for speaking opportunities, getting your face out there and building relationships. Probably get the time for one last one. Is, is there any advice you give somebody who runs a Drupal agency who is still direct to end developer and forms a position themselves among two sales reps when they potentially are still being quite techy? Yeah, I would say it's a really tough one to do because if you're a coder at heart and you're a techie person at heart, you're going to be really happy just writing lines of code and talking in IRC. Um, but if, you, if you're confident and ambitious and you want to be more of a technical salesperson, try and see if you can get a break from doing the actual project delivery. And do like a half day, one hour webinar, whatever it is, um, presentation tools and techniques and whatever. Um, you know, we've all, you probably think this of me, but we all see terrible speakers and terrible people get really nervous. My techies used to get really nervous in client pitches. Um, even though once they got into the flow, and they were talking about the LAMP stack and the Drush control and GitHub, they were fine. But when it comes to sales and client talking, you know, they forget to do the small talk and, you know, how was your day and where do you live and all that jazz. Got two minutes. And, oh, two, one, one minute each. Uh, can you um, say some more about the propo proposals for the Oh, Tracker? Yeah, is that a site or is that a tool? It's a tool, yeah, so I think Tracker are a company. Um, there's probably others, it was just, I like the guy, he's Scottish, he's nice. Um, and <laughs> it seems to be the one that scrapes them all. And you just sort of set your parameters, these are the things I want to look for, these are the things I want to get, and it just scrapes all council websites, government websites. It doesn't have any, many commercial contracts because commercial clients don't really pitch out like that, but Tracker's good. But there'll be others. Um, have a look at them. Um, can you recommend any like seminars and stuff like that, especially moving from like tech as the owner, sort of trying to get out there? Is there anything that you can kind of recommend? I probably don't know anything specifically to recommend, but I'm more than happy to try and put something on. Like not myself, I'll get a speaker in. Um, but yeah, maybe we can do that through the Drupal user group. I mean, I'm in the northwest, but I'm, I'm down here. Maybe we put that on. I don't really know many that are good necessarily. Sorry. Yes, well, yeah, obviously, you know, the CXO stuff are good, but if you're a newbie and you're new to that and you want to do a seminar around sort of how to learn to be a salesperson, then. Well, you don't really learn to be a salesperson. Just kind of do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get told off, but yeah, go on. Last question. Um, when you're kind of fixing for contracts, do you ever switch your day rates? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then I'll say, this is how much it is per day, and they'll go, hmm, and I'll go, we are expensive, but that's because we deliver, we've done it for these people, that people, this value, our guys are faster, because they are, some of the senior guys, got Barney's in there somewhere, you know, got these celebrities that um, are really great at tech and stuff, but um, then again, it's about that conversation about value and quality, isn't it, and pr value and price. Do you ever get knocked out of that kind of phase early, just because of that conversation? Yeah. Because my boss will go, you're not going below the day rate, right? and then you're out. Whereas previously I would, because I wanted the contract for me to pay the bills. So that's just me now. But before, I'd probably be able to negotiate a bit more. I was a director before, I'm not a director. Thanks, everyone. Hope it was useful.